Hello. So yes, I'm Terrell. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I think this is uh, extremely interesting. It's fun to see uh, what we consider our words being used now in uh, commercial products, uh, which is pretty, pretty wild. Um, so I'm going to use some of the same words again. Um, I work for, from start, for, starting from the bottom to the top. So I'm a state employee. I work at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, RENC is a Renaissance Computing Institute, one of 60 or 70 research institutes at UNC. And then the IRODS Consortium is a, uh, a fake legal entity inside of a fake legal entity um, in the university. Um, we are a member-driven organization. Uh, mission statement is to provide sustainability around this software that's been around for 20, 25 years now. Uh, IRODS was originally funded by uh, DARPA, DOD, DOE, uh, NSF, NIH, uh, different funding agencies for different pieces of the project. Um, as you well know, once uh, the science is done, they don't fund you anymore. Um, they don't fund maintenance. So we are the market solution for this piece of technology that's been uh, developed over the last few years. Uh, current shareable public logos <laughs> of our membership are here. Um, we've got largely storage vendors, uh, people doing science, and then we've got some technology integrators uh, that are basically the boots on the ground. Uh, we are not large enough to support uh, global uh, care and feeding of people's production systems. Uh, we provide the software and the, and the training and the expertise. Um, but we've started to see uh, more and more technology vendors, uh, not technology vendors, sorry, um, uh, integrators learning the technology and then, and then becoming the experts uh, locally. So we also provide policy-based open source data management. Uh, we consider ourselves data-centric. Everything's about the files themselves, uh, but it is metadata driven. And uh, this, from an open source perspective, provides an insurance policy against the changing technology. It, it will continue to change. Uh, you know, when we're gonna start putting data on crystals and you know, time and space moves around, supposedly we'll just be a plug-in away from being able to talk to that as well. So in terms of uh, infrastructure changing, obviously all these different things are continue to move. If uh, grown-ups have meetings and decide that your authentication has to change for your entire enterprise, we can deal with that as well. Uh, IRODS has seven plug-in interfaces, uh, and so we can talk to different types of uh, compute, storage, network authentication, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so haven't done definitions today, right? We've uh, heard a little bit about this. So data management really is about having a plan and being able to execute it and uh, keeping track of your stuff, right? That's the, that's the big picture. And we have found that in terms of, uh, well, maybe, maybe we're a little biased. When people come and talk to us, they've already got a problem. So maybe it's a bit of a self-selection situation. But um, most people are dealing with this uh, until they have a problem uh, with small scripts, some tribal knowledge, and uh, a lot of effort, and then a lot of hope. And that's, uh, that gets you a long way, but we think there's a better way. Um, we think if you can automate this stuff, then you've got a much greater chance of uh, having your data last for tens, hundreds of, hundreds of years. Uh, our clientele is started with uh, physics simulations when the data didn't fit on one disk. Uh, and then it moved into library land when the archives started to need to have provenance information and strong uh, archival uh, constructs around what they're, what they're finding and what they're storing. And then now we're seeing a lot of data generation coming from you know, genomics and uh, that kind of life science uh, use cases. Here's a very large picture of a data life cycle. Um, the, the main point of this is that uh, policy is great, but policy can, needs to change. And in fact, you need to have different policies in place at the same time for different types of data, different data that's uh, in different places along this life cycle. If you are an individual researcher or an individual uh, doing science, maybe it's just on your computer, maybe it's on a small cluster downstairs, but as soon as you have to share it with your team, potentially that means you need a different policy in place. As soon as it becomes part of a paper, 
it needs to be referenceable by others. As soon as it needs to be part of a reference collection, because congratulations, your paper was relevant, somebody liked it, uh, your data needs to be made available even more easily or with a dereferenceable DOI or something like that. So arguably that's a different policy that should be in charge of that data because it's more important. Maybe we don't get to use that word, but the point is that as the audience changes for the stuff, the policy arguably should be changing as well. And so the framework that we provide allows this kind of uh, co-resident multiplicity of, of policies depending on what it is you're trying to do. So as it matures, uh, we feel like we can handle that. We've talked a lot about data being uh, ingested and processed uh, at the edge now, and I think that's definitely what's happening. We've got, um, you know, you've got a curation issue at the front door, right? And so the, the point that, that this slide is supposed to make here is that if you can capture that provenance information, the source, the gold that's coming out of these sequencers, the satellites, the sheep, whatever it is that, that you're monitoring, um, it allows you to solve or, or this, this can be a part of a, of a larger solution. I mean, this is, these are very hard problems, but having information early allows you to go after these problems in a way that you couldn't necessarily before. So things like uh, harmonization, making sure that your formats are consistent, knowing that the, uh, the integrity is, is strong coming out of the you know, driverless car, whatever it is, if you need to make sure that, that the data hasn't changed. So all these things are more approachable if you've got more information from the beginning. So the claim here, two assertions, is that uh, metadata is really nothing more than annotations. Right? They don't mean anything in and of themselves. Uh, they could be bad. Uh, our friend from NASA talked about if the metadata is crap, then what do you have, right? So this is true. Um, these annotations can mean something to people, which is kind of the use cases we've heard. And then arguably, these pieces of metadata can also be important to programs, uh, scripts and, and, and policies that can come along later. Uh, metadata can be descriptive, which is part of what we've heard about. Uh, a little bit of what uh, Frank just spoke about, I think that metadata can actually be prescriptive. Um, you can annotate things so that you can, you can talk about aspirational metadata, right? You tag something so that another script will come along and do something to it, right? The, the policy can come along and take action based on the metadata. And so in terms of definition of archive, that means something very different to different people. Um, from our perspective, it just means that it's another copy somewhere else, uh, possibly safer, cheaper. Uh, it has to be discoverable, obviously. And, um, and then it's no good if you can't get it back. So these can both be handled with configuration and policy. Automatic policy-based solutions are what are gonna allow you to avoid the vendor lock-in moving forward. If you have that 100-year archive library perspective on data, you want to be flexible. So we do four things well. We abstract the storage. We provide a place to write metadata down in a catalog. And we provide a policy engine where you can write, this, uh, write these policies. Uh, right now, you can write it in, in Python, and that, everybody loves that. The last thing is that this is an open protocol, so you can federate with any other installation of IRODs, which allows you to have a namespace that can span uh, time and space in different domains. If you've got people that you, uh, subcontractors that only need access to data for a certain window of time, you can spin up a federation, do the work, maybe data doesn't even move, you just give them access into your namespace, and then you can tear down that federation at the end and uh, nobody will ever know. Some of the policy, oh, so if we go back, uh, our little fancy graphic up here top left, it's extremely uh, fancy graphic, it's a square with some other rectangles inside of it. So as we move from the bottom to the top, uh, these are kind of the core, core technologies. Uh, the policies that we've seen in the wild that are based on this, uh, we've got things that are covered from synchronization, verification um, around the data itself, as well as uh, making sure that your metadata is clean and good. Again, if it's not any good, then you can't do very much with it. Uh, moving up a little higher, we've seen the patterns around how people deployed those particular policies across different domains of science and uh, engineering. 
And so these are the eight things that we have identified as what people want to do. Uh, arguably, there might be more. We haven't seen them. Uh, we certainly haven't named them and put them on our slide yet. Uh, if you have a ninth, please come let me know. We'd love to have another circle on our picture. If your data is uh, relatively local and you've got a giant computer, you can stage the data to your computer and do the science. Register the results in the namespace and you're back to where you are. It's great. This is a, a virtuous cycle in the bottom right of the data to compute uh, pattern that we've seen. Uh, equal and opposite, if your data is too big, too heavy, too special, uh, HIPAA compliance not allowed to move, you can take your data, you can take your compute to your data. So with container-based technologies now, policy-based, you can fire off a particular job, you can take your stack with you um, and go operate on the data where it lives. And then again, the results can be registered back in the namespace and you've got full provenance as to what happened, what ran, what versions, and you can then supposedly have some reproducible science, which arguably is the only kind of science that matters. We've also heard a lot of use cases where people buy another company, uh, they've got lots of disparate file systems all over the place, uh, and they need to do some synchronization. So we've got uh, tooling now in place where you can synchronize from different file systems uh, into the cloud, into local. Uh, it's, it's all uh, rather generic from our perspective, and uh, it's just a small matter of uh, time to move things around. So here's the eight circles uh, I talked about a second ago. Um, Again, if you've got a ninth, that'd be great. As far as we can tell, every, every use case that we've heard from uh, people in pain for the last few years is a subset of these eight things. And so we argue that uh, with an open source platform, then you can solve this in a generic way and uh, protect yourself from the future. You also don't have to implement all of it. You can implement the thing that is most painful now for you, automate that, and then as you need a little bit more of this, you can add on the pieces later, and we'd be there to help you. Uh, another minute or so, uh, a couple examples. Um, this, is the, this is when the truth is coming from an external source, and it hasn't been yet put into uh, a namespace. Uh, so you can see if it validates and it's good and pull it into the namespace, or, and then dispose of it. Uh, the next one here is where the truth is actually outside. So IRODS is downstream from the truth. Uh, we do not want to be in the, in the data path. We do not want to be in, in the way of your fast, fancy computers. Right? We are here to help you keep track of it before and after the fast, fancy computers are doing their job. And so if the truth is outside, then we can keep up with that. This is a open source implementation of I think, not having full information on the last couple presentations, um, I think we can do most of what was presented uh, with some metadata. We're still learning about the use cases, but uh, if you annotate things well, you can move it around and you can schedule your jobs and you can tier out arbitrarily, you can tier back. And again, all of this is handled within the namespace and you can always federate with someone else who wants to do something slightly different. Uh, these are independent, uh, administrative organizations, so your rules work in your house and their rules work in their house, and if you cross the bridge, you're, you're in their house, their policies are in place, their access controls are in place. When they're in your house, yours are in charge. Here's a bigger version of the same couple pictures. All these slides are available. Uh, all this information is on our website as well. Uh, so the takeaways here, um, Really, that we think that automatic policy-based solutions are the answer. They'll last much longer uh, than some alternatives. If you have a programmatic interface into your entire um, infrastructure, we think that uh, you can handle all these use cases pretty cleanly. Uh, everything that we do is based on policy enforcement points, and uh, everything, every one of those policy enforcement points, every operation in the entire system is a hook where you can write your own code to go take action, to go launch an agent, to go check the metadata, to go uh, perform a checksum send an email to the boss, report, you know, whatever it needs to do. Uh, we've also, in, in honor of the fact that if the metadata is crap, it doesn't matter, uh, we've got pretty robust solutions now around metadata templates, which will allow the librarians to have a strong opinion and make sure that everybody else behaves. Um, if you've got special vocabulary and taxonomies, great. 
Uh, if you want to use standard ones, that's fine too. You can reference those. But these allow you to prove compliance and uh, help you make stuff publishable. Uh, last slide, we've got some on, uh, ongoing and upcoming work. Uh, again, this is all consortium driven, so the people in the room get to vote. Uh, our, our access to Object Store has required a local uh, cache uh, in the past because we're doing the semantic uh, uh, convergence between uh, POSIX and Object. Uh, we are now looking at, and we have a, uh, a prototype, and we're going to roll it out soon for a cacheless S3, so we'll be doing that um, translation live, uh, local in the buffer, and there's no cache. <clears throat> no, no cache that's written to disk. Uh, a lot of people want to take the power of the API that we provide, the IROD's API, but they only want their existing, they don't want to learn anything new, so they want their existing tooling and their existing uh, scripts to be able to just write to a, a, a mount point like always. So we are now, uh, have a project that's <clears throat> going to be rolled out in production in the next week or two uh, where IROD's will present as NFS4. Uh, and so you don't have a, a view into the metadata through that interface, obviously, but um, in terms of reads, writes, that kind of stuff, uh, your existing tooling can, can go through the, the, the front door of the IROD's API through an NFS mount point. Uh, we're going to take that learning uh, and, and create a sister project for SIFS rods uh, so that uh, our Windows friends can be happy as well. Uh, and then we've got a new project now for um, RDMA integration for the um, uh, transport layer for our... Uh, our plugins so that we can actually write into somebody else's computer, which is a little terrifying, but uh, that's how it works. I think I'm out of time. Uh, any questions? All of our code is open and documentation, please go read. We have a user group meeting in June in Utrecht. Uh, this will be the 11th annual. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, I'd love to have people come and talk uh, if you've got any interest in or, or use cases about what you're doing already. Yes. Yeah, quick question. Are you thinking about uh, policies for sunsetting data? I mean, you can't save it all yes. forever. Yes, uh, the lawyers uh, are very interested in deleting data. Um, so yes, it's just a matter of policy. Uh, that's, that's always our answer. So pretty much any question you ask me in the next couple of minutes, the answer will be it's a small matter of policy. But yeah, data retention is uh, certainly realistic and, and, and very real. So um, <coughs> you've got any and all of the available information in the system to make those determinations, uh, be it age-based or uh, extremely sensitive or that lawsuit is over, so we should delete all of the evidence. Uh, yes. Right. Daryl, thank you. Thank you.